Hey, what's up, class? So in this final lecture, a short lecture from Chapter 3 in your textbook, I'm going to talk about self-disclosure. Now, your book defines self-disclosure as the process of deliberately revealing information about oneself that is significant and would not normally be known by others. So these are, these are the three necessary criteria for self-disclosure. Again, so if you're, if you're performing self-disclosure, you have to deliberately, so you know, on purpose, reveal information about yourself that is significant, that's important, and that wouldn't normally be known by other people. So then, let me ask you a question. Which of the following statements might be considered self-disclosure? I live at 1061 Cushmore Road, my favorite color is blue, or I'm an alcoholic. Well, out of those three choices, the, the best answer would be, I'm an alcoholic, right? I'm telling you on purpose, I'm doing it deliberately. I'm, I'm sharing important information, significant information about myself that you wouldn't normally know, right? I could tell you my favorite color is blue, but the, you know, who cares? That's not important. I could tell you I live at 1061 Cushmore Road. Again, this, this really isn't significant and it's something you can find if you look me up. Now, I don't really live at 1061 Cushmore Road. But if I did, it's something you can look up online and find, right? So, again, I'm an alcoholic. Would be, of these three, uh, the, the best example of self-disclosure. Now, we have lots of models in communication. And, and models don't necessarily represent reality, which is important to remember. But they do give us an idea or, or a method, a, a pattern, uh, for, for thinking about things. And so one of the models that we deal with is what's called the social penetration model of self-disclosure. Now this model takes into account two different factors. So there's the breadth or the, the scope of the disclosure, right? How much you're disclosing, what kind of information you're disclosing, right? The range of, of subjects being discussed. And then there's the depth of your communication, which is really the deeper you go in terms of depth, the more personal you get, the more significant you get in terms of the information that you're disclosing. So, for example, out here in terms of depth would be my favorite color is blue. In here it would be, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a drug addict, right? My mother never, never loved me. Right? That takes you right to the core. So you see, again, breadth is just the range of things you can talk about. And you can talk about a lot of things and, and stay out here on the superficial level. So I like pizza. My favorite color is blue. My hair is brown. My eyes are blue. Right? I mean, there are all kinds of, of things, big range of topics that we can talk about and stay at the superficial level. However, as we go deeper, right, the range actually gets smaller and the information that we disclose gets more and more personal. So again, you can really think of it kind of like an onion, right? So, so there are all these different layers and the further you go into the onion, the more layers you peel back, the more personal you get. Another model for self-disclosure is what's known as the Johari window. Now, this is all about elements that we hide from other people, right? The, the things that we, we keep to ourselves, and even things that, that, that we don't know about ourselves, things that, in a sense, you could say, we hide from ourselves. So they call it a window because it kind of looks like a window, right, with four panes. And the idea is there are some things that are known to you. There are some things that are unknown to you. There are some things that are known to others and some things that are unknown to others. So, as a result, the things that are known to you and you make known to others, those are part of what Johari would call your open self. Information about you that both you and others know about. Now, there's some things you know about yourself that you don't share, or you choose not to share with other people. This is your hidden self. Information that you know about yourself, but others don't know. Then, believe it or not, there are some things that you don't know about yourself that other people do. So information about you that you don't know, but other people do. And then finally, 
at least in theory, there's another category, which is the unknown self. And this is information that you don't know about yourself and that other people aren't aware of either. Now, I, I know some students have asked me in the past, Eric, how can there be this, this thing that nobody knows about? You don't know about this part of yourself and other people don't know about it. Well, to answer that, I always said, you know, we, there are some things we don't know about ourselves until we're placed in certain situations. So, for example, you might not know how you're going to react if you're on a sinking ship. Maybe, maybe you actually, you know, run for the lifeboat and get in front of all the women and children and you're, and you're selfish and you didn't even know it. And that didn't come out until you were in that particular moment. That quality, that unfortunate quality, would be part of your unknown self. So some of the benefits of self-disclosure, when we intentionally let people know significant things about ourselves, it can help with catharsis. Right? Catharsis is a fancy word that comes from the Greek that means mental and emotional relief. Catharsis is what you feel when you get something off your chest. So when you when you you know admit to your parents, you know I, I broke your your dish, mom, right? And you feel better. That's catharsis. Self disclosure also results in what we call reciprocity. So if you tell somebody something important about yourself that's private, usually they'll respond with something similar. This is what happens oftentimes when people get into relationships, right? You, this is when you're on the phone all night talking with that special person and you're telling each other all about yourselves and your experiences and you're like, my mom never loved me. And then they tell you, my dad never loved me. That's reciprocity. Self-clarification, sometimes telling people about yourself helps you make sense of your own beliefs, opinions, and attitudes. Sometimes it's good just to talk and, and, and tell people about yourself in order to understand yourself better. Now, sometimes we, we perform self-disclosure because we want what's called self-validation. That's when we tell people things about ourselves in, in hope of, of getting them to agree with us, to tell us that we're okay, to, to let us know that we're not weird or strange and, 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 and that they support you and that they still love you, right? That, that, that they approve of who you are. Sometimes we perform self-disclosure to build and maintain relationships. So to start a relationship, even if it's just a friendship, usually this requires self-disclosure. You need to tell people things about yourself. And I should also note that there's a strong link between self-disclosure and marital satisfaction. People who, who, who speak openly and self-disclose to one another uh, share their feelings and, and emotions and uh, you know, their the private selves with someone else, this usually results in a better marriage. And then finally, social influence can be achieved through self-disclosure. We can tell people things about ourselves that can, can increase our control over that other person. Now, I know this sounds strange, but for example, if, if we went to lunch one day and, and they served alcohol at the establishment, and I told you I was an alcoholic, chances are you probably wouldn't order yourself a drink. So you see that sometimes disclosing information about yourself can affect how other people behave. Now, there are risks associated with self-disclosure. People can reject us. You might tell someone something about yourself that's private, and they think it's awful, and they reject you. It might result in a negative impression. People think you're a terrible human being. It can also result in decreased relational satisfaction. I, you know, so for example, if you cheated on your, on your boyfriend and, and you self-disclosed, you told him, right, I cheated on you because I don't really love you, this could seriously screw up your relationship, right? So there are times when self-disclosure can work negatively on relational satisfaction. It can also result in a loss of influence. If I told you private things about myself that made you think less of me, you probably wouldn't be as influenced by me as a teacher. And then finally, we can also hurt other people with the things we say. This goes back to this idea of the decrease in relational satisfaction. So, for example, if I self-disclosed to my wife, hey, you know, when I went to that convention out in Las Vegas, I, I hired a bunch of strippers and we had a big party with hookers, that would probably hurt her feelings, right? So, so we, we need to think about and consider these things sometimes before we perform self-disclosure. So there are some guidelines, some questions that you can ask yourself 
before you engage in self-disclosure. Is the other person important to you? Is the kind of disclosure you're making appropriate? Are the risks reasonable? Will it have a constructive effect on your relationship? Will the other person likely respond with their own kind of self-disclosure? Have they already self-disclosed to you? And then finally, do you have a moral obligation to make these disclosures? All good things to ask yourself before you engage in self-disclosure. Now, related to self-disclosure is a notion of silence. We've already talked about the, the idea that you can never not communicate, that you're like a, a transmitter that can't be turned off. So when, when we're silent, there, there, there are different things that we could be doing, right? We could be committing, for example, a lie of omission. So, so sometimes we lie simply by not telling people things, by maintaining silence. So again, with my example, if I didn't tell my wife about the strippers in Las Vegas, that would be a lie of omission. <laughs> At other times, of course, we, we commit lies of commission. That's when we just straight up lie on purpose. And, and sometimes, related to these, we need to ask ourselves, is it best to keep our feelings to, to ourselves? Should we, should we commit a lie of omission in order to maintain our relationship? Is it better not to tell someone how we feel about them? Sometimes it is. Talking a little bit more about lies, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes we engage in what, what are called excuse me, benevolent lies. Now, uh, there are a lot of benevolent lies. Sometimes these are called little white lies. Sometimes we tell these to avoid conflict. Um, you know, we, 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 we don't like somebody or we don't like something they did, but we, we don't say anything about it or we, we lie about it in order to avoid a fight. Sometimes we lie just to avoid interaction. Somebody might, you know, are you coming to my party on Friday night? Oh, you know, I, I, I got to wash my dog. You know, we, we lie to, to prevent having to interact with other people. Sometimes we, we lie just to get out of the room, just to get out of the situation. That's known as leave taking. So, uh, Eric, do you have time to talk to me after class? Oh, no, I got a class right after this. I'm sorry. Right. And then finally, sometimes we lie to save face just just so that we don't embarrass ourselves. Now, Lying can, of course, threaten a relationship, and it's worse if your lie is seen as self-serving or exploitative. So if it seems like you're lying to, for your own purposes, to make yourself look better, or, or to take advantage of somebody, that can really damage a relationship. Now, similar to lying, but, but slightly different, is, is this idea of equivocation. And I, I'm, I, I really am interested in, in this notion of equivocation. I, I find it really really intriguing. So an equivocation is, is uh, neither a false message nor a clear truth, but rather an alternative used precisely when both of these are to be avoided. So most people would rather equivocate than tell a lie. So for example, you get an ugly sweater from your grandmother, and she asks, you know, do you like it? And, and your response is, oh, granny, you're so thoughtful. That's an equivocation. You're not answering, right? You're not, you're not lying. Oh, I love it. But you're not telling the truth either. Like, I hate it, Granny, it's ugly, right? Instead, you say, oh, you're so thoughtful. That's an equivocation. Now, hints are more direct than equivocation. A hint is just a subtle message that depends on the receiver to decode the message accurately, right? So you hint to someone. Oftentimes, I hint to, to people in my classes. Well, you know, if, if, I, I, Eric, am I going to pass? Well, I, you know, it, it's, it'd really be good to study hard for that next test, right? Now, that's both an equivocation and a hint, right? What, what I'm doing there is, is I'm hoping that they'll pick up on the idea that their grade really depends on, on, on that last test, on the final exam. But, but again, it's up to the student to realize that I'm hinting at something there. Now, hints, equivocations... And white lies, benevolent lies, allow us to manage difficult situations. And, and, and the ethics of, of lying or equivocating or hinting in these kinds of situations really depend on your motive. So if, if you're equivocating uh, in order to, 
you know, in some kind of self-serving way or, or to take advantage of someone else, or you're lying to take advantage of someone else, then that would be generally considered to be unethical, right? But it really depends on what you're trying to do, on what linguists would call the illocutionary force of your statement, right? Because so often what we say and what we mean, the illocutionary force is what you mean, right, are two entirely different things. So, so for example, if, if I see you in the hallway, I might say to you, oh, hey, how are you? Now, I'm, I'm asking you, literally, how are you? How are you doing? But it, I don't really want to know, do I? I mean, the illocutionary force of that is that it's just a greeting. It's just a way of acknowledging that you're there. I don't really care how you're doing. And you know what? You're not going to answer truthfully either sometimes. You know, if you ask somebody how they're doing, the expected answer is, oh, I'm fine. You know, I did that today. When I went in to see the dentist with the broken tooth, the dentist says to me, how are you? And I go, oh, I'm fine. And then I thought about it for a minute. And I, I said to her, you know what? I don't know why I told you that. I'm actually like dying here. I got a broken tooth. I feel terrible. This thing's killing me. Right? And she laughed because she understood that, the, that there's a difference right, between what I meant and, and what I said. But she understood why I said it. All right, that's it for, for this chapter in your textbook, and, and thanks for, for checking out this, this mini-lecture.